Aloha. Thank you guys all for joining us for our Thursday, June 11th, uh, Hanama Talks, presented by the University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program, Hanama Bay Education Program. Today, I have Carlo Caruso from the Gates Coral Lab, and he'll be talking about selective propagation of resilient corals for reef restoration. So without further ado, Carlo. Thank you. Um, hello, and thank you to Hanama Bay Education Program for hosting this talk. Um, obviously, this is recorded rather than live due to the coronavirus social distancing guidelines that we're all adapting to. Uh, my name is Carlo, and I'm here today representing the Gates Coral Lab to talk about some projects and some approaches that we're involved with that are related to coral reef resilience under climate change. And I'm going to start off with an analogy about adaptation and adjustment that highlights some bio biology concepts that our projects and our approaches are based on. Um, so, you know, this, this is me um, personally, I don't know about you, but I, I feel a lot of anxiety about giving presentations, a lot of stress. I thought it would be different in front of um, the recording versus live audience, but it's not that much different, it's still like anxiety inducing. And we know that's not really logical, it's just some kind of visceral response. However, um, I have some flexibility and some plasticity in my behavior to adjust to that. So I can do some breathing exercises and I can increase my comfort a little bit um, or just acknowledge the anxiety out loud like I'm doing now. Um, but I can also lose comfort if some other stress is on me or you know, if I forget to wear pants or something. Um, so I've got that range of, of comfort that I'm able to exhibit but I've got limits and my individual range ends up I put it like down at the lower end of the scale of comfort with public speaking um, and you could imagine yourself somewhere on here um, there are people um, that are very far at the other end of the spectrum like they just love to be around people and talk all the time and so we can have different individuals in a population that don't even overlap with each other in their exhibition of some trait. And that's an analogy for complex biological traits. So these are traits that arise from numerous factors that combine together to form a continuum of behavior or physical attributes. And the orange bell curve that I've got there in the background in the picture represents that. It's like a normal distribution of individuals. So there's few individuals that are toward each end of the population and the majority are near the middle for whatever trait we're talking about. And today we're going to be talking about heat tolerance in corals, which is thought to be a complex trait like this. Um, and indeed, when we observe coral populations undergoing heat stress during bleaching events, um, we see a whole wide range of responses. So at the extreme ends of the range are the examples like I've just shown at the top, where two corals from the same species that are adjacent to each other can exhibit vastly different um, bleaching forms. So one is completely pale and bleached under heat stress, and the other one still appears to be fully pigmented. And then all over the reef, there's gonna be corals that are somewhere in between those, those two extremes. Um, and this brings me to another example in, in a very different organism, corn, um, but there's a good experiment that helps us see how that having variety in a population can allow for the population to adapt well beyond its current range for, for a given trait. Um, a good place to observe that is this corn experiment that I mentioned that was done at the University of Illinois. For over 100 years, they did artificial selection on some traits in corn that they were interested in. And I've just plotted here the results from one lineage of corn that was being picked for its oil production. And over time, you can see the oil production in corn is, is going way up. And one thing that's very striking to me is that oil production does not simply level off after a few generations, right? In the 1800s at the beginning, the farthest, you know, most high performing corn individuals were producing about 5% oil. And then 100 generations later, just picking individuals from just the high end that distribution, now the average is like 20%. So clearly selection on the existing genetic variation that's in a population can drive a tremendous amount of adaptation in the population. So let's get back to coral. Um, coral has really different demographics from corn. Corn turns over each year 
Well, coral has really much longer life and can have a lot longer times to get to reproductive um, ability. Um, and it also can, the bigger the coral gets to an extent, the more reproductive success it has. Um, so that has implications for a coral population that's under a selective pressure, like the rising sea temperature that we have due to the climate change. Um, and in that, we're expecting to see increases of a couple of degrees over a single century. Uh, models and simulations are indicating that coral populations have adaptive capacity to persist under that kind of um, rate of stress, um, in which case individuals are gonna die off and some new individuals that are adapted to the conditions will start to emerge. Um, and while that's really great news for those corals, it's not necessarily great news for coral reefs because having just a few adapted individuals might not provide enough physical integrity and continuity to function as a reef. So if that same change in temperature were stretched out over a long, uh, much longer span of time, more natural span of time, like thousands and uh, thousands of years, then the rate of selective pressure would be better matched to the demographics of coral. So then the gaps would get filled in kind of in like a more timely fashion and the physical coverage of the reef would be maintained over time. So filling in those gaps that are emerging in the present is a goal of people involved in reef restoration. And that's important because leaving the conceptual world for a moment, we live here in this real world where reefs are vital to human well-being. Um, they provide us with coastal protection, absorb wave energy, um, prevent erosion and inundation. Um, and they also are part of vital food webs and they're integral to community identity. So either because we love coral reefs for what they are or because we fear the, um, what's gonna happen if they're lost or degraded, um, people are increasingly looking to find active management actions we could take to just preserve coral reefs in the near, nearer term. And for me personally, my interest in this really got started when I was working for the National Park Service as a ranger in the Manua Islands in American Samoa. Um, and there, there's the fringing reef is a very prominent feature of the park outlined here. Uh, the, the coral there was lush, healthy. There's an enormous amount of diversity. Um, but what I realized and other people realize is even in a remote, seemingly pristine place, corals are not safe from a warming ocean because you can't just like cordon them off to protect them. They're part of a global system. So I came to work and study at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology to educate myself and to participate in research um, that has potential for management applications. And the Gates Coral Lab is interested in multiple ways that existing heat tolerance in coral populations might be able to be harnessed to help create more resilient reefs. And one set of projects involves the sexual reproduction of corals. So as we discussed before, sexual reproduction supports adaptation. And here I've drawn it a different way. I've drawn a couple of generations in like the style of a family tree. So the coral at the bottom is the offspring of the two above it and then the grandparents are up at the top. And the bell curves um, with the X's are just showing like examples of, of hypothetically where those individuals might be in terms of like more or less heat tolerance. And so through time, through those generations, um, the heat tolerance might be increasing like we saw with the corn example. But we also talked about how that could be a really, really slow process. And however, through selective breeding, which is what was being done in the corn example, humans were, were artificially like uh, affecting which corals crossed with each other. Um, a process like that can be sped up by, by purposely crossing corals or groups of corals that already have a very high level of heat tolerance with each other and then potentially that could generate offsprings with like new levels of heat tolerance and it could do that more rapidly. And right now, um, it's June and we're currently in the spawning season for Montipara capitata, um, also known as the rice coral. It's one of the main reef builders in Kaneohe Bay where the lab is located. And this species has various growth forms and colors as seen in the picture. And it spawns at a precise time of night close to the new moon during the summer months. And so it's a really magic and hectic time, busy time for our lab 
um, because there's a lot of prep work and a lot of active work. So for the selective breeding kinds of experiments, we go out during the day and we place a temporary, very fine mesh over particular colonies of interest. And those nets um, can be equipped with a collection chamber at the top, as in this picture, so that when the corals release their bundles of eggs and sperm, those bundles can be captured um, and, and we can get them. And we can know which coral they came from. And then after we've deployed our equipment, we have to wait until night. And if we've been really good about our predictions and the timing is right, then we're rewarded with one of the most absolutely magical experiences you can have um, in the water as all over the reefs, the Montipara colonies start to release these buoyant bundles and they're doing it like in a synchronized unison. And those bundles start to drift up toward the surface and they start to accumulate there on top of the water until the whole surface of the ocean is really dense with these, with these bundles of eggs and sperm. And if you're staring down in the water with a headlamp, it's like looking into like a galaxy or into a field of stars um, and, and the abundance is, is pretty overwhelming. So besides collecting the stuff that we get in those, in those collection bottles on the nets, we also dip bundles directly off the surface of the water as the spawning peaks. And that helps us get a sample from like a really wide cross section of the population. And we gather that the bundles into buckets with our little scoop nets. We put it into the buckets and this is what the bundles look like. Um, so those bundles contain both eggs and sperm from an individual coral because Montipara are hermaphrodites and are both male and female produce both eggs and sperm. The brown color in the bundles is because these bundles are also preloaded with the symbiotic um, algae that live in Montipara and allow photosynthesis. Um, and so since the corals make both eggs and sperm, um, they have some chemical tricks to avoid fertilizing themselves. Um, and then it's not until the bundles start breaking apart on the ocean surfaces and different bundles material starts interacting that eggs really start getting fertilized a lot. And so before that breakage happens, we isolate samples into containers and vials so that we can control um, the fertilization that's happening. Um, once fertilization hap has happened, um, we rinse the embryos um, to just get away the extra sperm, clean the water, and we release the, the embryos into conical tanks um, so that they can grow into coral larvae. And that takes several days. Um, and, but if we're good at it and we're careful and we, we're clean and we're lucky, we end up with lots of swimming coral larvae. And I apologize for not having a better picture of swimming coral larvae, but they're very small. Um, what we do with those larvae is we um, introduce them to chunks of calcium carbonate called plugs, um, which in this picture, you're seeing the bottoms of the plugs, which are color coded for use in an experiment. And they're sitting in little baskets of water and the larvae will get poured in there and they seem to like to make their way underneath the plug and settle on what's eventually going to become the top of the plug. So we, we prime them for success knowing that that's, that's a preference that they have. Um, and then later, once they've attached, we flip the plugs to upright and the corals continue to grow with the benefit of being able to um, get photosynthesis from their symbiotic algae. And about a year later, we can end up with a little juvenile Montipara colony like this one. So that's a pretty intensive pipeline, and we're always working on methods to improve the survivorship and efficiency. Um, in addition to researching making crosses where we pick the parents, we're also working on a way of just screening wild, um, big numbers of wild juveniles from random crosses um, during their early life stages and pick the ones with better heat tolerance. And then we can invest a lot of our effort in just growing those. But with either of those potential approaches, it's a way to generate more heat tolerant individuals that could then be used in reef restoration efforts. A completely different way to make new corals is by asexual propagation. So unlike a lot of animals, corals can actually be broken apart and each piece can grow and continue to get bigger and form a, a new colony. And then those pieces could in turn be fragmented and, and form new colonies. Um, so that's a way that you can produce a lot of material from some starting stock. So if there's a particular colony of interest 
Um, you can take a small sample and glue it on a plug and instantly we're way ahead of where we were with that one-year-old juvenile in terms of the growth potential. However, what we don't have is the potential for genetic remixing because this new coral on this plug is an exact clone of the existing one that we got it from. Um, uh, but we're going to look at how this technique can still be beneficial to adaptation, even though it lacks that quality that sexual reproduction has. Um, reef restoration projects often employ the strategy of propagating the corals in order to farm coral stocks that they're going to use to plant on the reef. So here's some little fragments that have been, or medium-sized fragments that have been planted on the reef. Um, and a major realization that's been had in reef restoration is that we don't want to just plant those corals in a place where they're going to turn around and die. So this is a lot of work. So generally, um, reef restoration efforts need to try to mitigate whatever was causing the loss of coral in that place in the first place before putting the new coral out. And with climate change, that's a special problem because it's not an easy threat to mitigate, not locally. If we had a time machine and a way to visit the reef in the future, um, we would go forward several decades and maybe we would find that our beautiful reef has undergone a bunch of mass bleaching events and it's become a wasteland of rubble and dominated by macro algae, uh, which would be sad. But here and there, we might also see that some individual corals um, have survived. And we could take that knowledge and we could return back to the present day and arriving here today, we would make sure that any coral stock that we're out planting is grown from the genotypes that we observed were going to survive. Now, we don't have the benefit of being able to look into the future to pick corals for restoration in that way, but, that's, but we're exploring an approach to apply that kind of thinking. Um, and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation has funded a project here in Hawaii that brings together several partner organizations, um, ourselves and the NOAA Coral Restoration Center, um, Department of Aquatic Resources and Malama Mauna Lua to do a test project. And that project is gonna span several years. It is spanning several years and at least three sites that are noted here. Um, each site with a slightly different flavor of the restoration test. So it's at the area number one on the South Shore, we're already working there near the Honolulu Airport on a site that involves planting larger, full-size salvaged coral colonies. Um, soon we're expanding to work in Kanohe Bay, where we will be doing the asexual propagation and outplanting smaller colonies. And then most exciting is when we'll be um, working toward Mauna Lua Bay, we're doing true restoration work on like a little bit bigger scale, again, using asexual propagation and with a major volunteer component of um, getting lots of hands involved to um, get corals out on the reef. A big necessity of the project is an ability to assess the coral stocks that we're thinking of using for their heat tolerance so that we can classify them as more or less temperature resilient. And one way we do that is by using direct evidence that we can get from a, like an artificial heat stress test. Um, so in 2018, we had drawn up this plan, um, just like a sketch basically, to make a large aquarium system with programmable temperature control. And somehow through blood, sweat, tears, and a generous um, infrastructure grant from the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, we've, re we've been able to make it a reality. Um, so we have a filtering station where we pump water in from the ocean and, and filter, filter out the, the large debris. Um, and then we have industrial sized heaters and chillers to make cooled and heated seawater. Um, and this machine is like a big air conditioner unit you might see outside a building, but instead of cooling air, it's set up to cool the water as it passes by. And then we store the warm and cool water in large insulated thousand gallon reservoirs, like big hydro flasks. Um, and from there it gets distributed to our individual tanks. And this is what the, the tank system where the corals live lo looks like. This is like their life support system. Each of those white tanks has a controller unit. It's a box that's in teal color at the top that's, that controls the temperature inside that tank. Um, and we built those ourselves. They're, they're inside of them is a small computer and some other electronics that are hooked up to motorized valves and connected to Wi-Fi so that we can give them instructions on what temperatures we want to have for that day or that week or that month. And we can have those temperatures changing all the time. And that way we can precisely regulate how much warm and cool water is entering each tank, entering each tank individually. 
And the process of building the system was a huge learning experience for, for me, for the lab, and we ended up doing everything pretty much in-house from digging the trenches to fabricating like little micro circuit boards, um, partly because we needed to save money and partly because we wanted to have control and understand the whole system from top to bottom. So we're really excited to have this system. Um, it's it's going to help us do lots of experiments, including doing the kinds of heat stress tests that we need to do to, to pick corals that we think um, are going to be the ones that might be more resilient for the restoration. So at the South Shore site by the airport, work is already going on. Um, NOAA has installed a coral nursery platform, and that platform is stocked with salvaged corals. And what we've done is for each of the about 425 colonies that are on that platform, we've drilled a small hole into the base of the colony and installed a mounting pin and then we've tagged the colony with a unique ID. Um, we've also taken a small fragment sample from each colony, a living piece, so basically like the asexual propagation that I talked about. And those small samples shown here in this picture are basically proxies for the colony that they, they came from. And so what we end up with is having like a mini version of each of the big colonies that's out on that nursery that we can perform an experiment on and get some information about how we think that the, the large colony um, might behave. And so after a quarantine period, which we can all relate to, um, these chunks are placed into our tank system. And when, then we start elevating the temperature over a period of a few weeks. And so for reference, the, the average water temperatures in, for Oahu fall between the blue lines there. And so pretty quickly, these corals are getting pushed up out of their comfort zone um, and getting and get really hot. And by the end of the heat stress, most all of the corals ha had severely bleached or were dead. And you can see the change in the corals looking at the earlier photograph and then over to the later photograph. Um, and during that transition each day, we scored the health of every one of the fragments, so 400 or so, um, on a scale from zero for it's dead or it's fully bleached up to like three, which is fully um, healthy and pigmented. And then we looked at the average um, score for every fragment over the whole time of the heat stress. And the outcome of that was a distribution that looks somewhat like the bell curve that I had earlier. Obviously it's not quite as pretty as a fake uh, perfect bell curve, but um, you see a a big spike on the far left of about 50 samples. And those are fragments that either bleached or died during the months of quarantine. So after they were sampled, but before we even started the test, we, we had some corals um, that died. And then once the test started, um, everything to the right happened. And we could draw a line somewhere in this distribution. I mean, this line is arbitrary, but you could consider corals to the right of this line to be more heat tolerant um, than the corals to, to the left of the, of the line. And so in that way, we're sort of ranking or parsing out which corals um, we think might perform better under hotter water conditions. And so here's a few example colonies that are from different parts of the, that distribution. Um, in green are some that are more up in the more higher performing part of the distribution. And in yellow are some colonies that were from the lower part and if you're just looking at the appearance of the colony, um, you, it wouldn't have given us any indication of how its little sample or it, it itself would have performed under the heat stress. So the next big step is taking um, the colonies from the nursery and moving them out into the wild um, and into assigned plots where they actually get planted out onto the um, substrate. And we've got three types of plots. So there's some plots where we do absolutely nothing. So no alteration, we don't plant any new corals. These are baseline controls just to see what, what, what's happening in the background with no effect from us. Um, and then we have plots where we plant a mix of corals, but they're not chosen to be particularly heat tolerant ones. So um, that's kind of like more of a random stop. And then finally we have plots where we purposely plant corals that are the ones that performed higher in the heat stress. And the question is for us over time, how will the corals in the different plots fare and how will the plot as a whole 
um, fair. In order to figure out how the corals are doing, you know, and, and also other things like fish coming to the area and things of that nature, um, we need to do some kind of monitoring. So a little clip is playing. This looks real chaotic. This person swimming around. Um, and this is plot photogrammetry. Um, and what it is is basically stitching together lots and lots and lots of individual photos to get a high resolution composite picture of a whole site. So this schematic, along with the, the video of the person swimming around and around in circles, um, kind of captures our technique. So our technique is to use a spool um, at the center of the plot, and then that controls the path of a diver who's swimming in a spiral, um, and the lines end up equally spaced. And the, the diver who's swimming has a camera that's set to shoot video or very high frame rate um, with good resolution. So as they swim around, they end up covering the whole plot. And this picture is kind of showing um, a swim spiral with just red dots wherever a photo was taken. So thousands and thousands of pictures are getting taken over a plot that has a few meters of diameter. But a computer can take the photo from every one of those red dots and it can start relating that information um, together in a way that we would never be able to do just by like sorting through stacks of photos. Um, and that ends up yielding a really good picture of the site as a whole. And you can see individual colonies and, and the shapes and the structures and, and what's going on. Additionally, um, there's enough information because the camera, the, the so many pictures that are taken at different angles that the computer can also create a 3D model of the site. So we know the shape and the structure um, as well as just the, the image. Um, so we can, we can use that as a way to come back to the plot, take another scan with our camera and compare it to how it was a year ago, two years ago, things like that. And this is an example from the Great Barrier Reef from a plot that looked like this in 2014. So you see several different species, a lot of living coral. Um, a hurricane event happened in 2015, followed by um, a coral bleaching event, which wiped out a lot of the living coral tissue. And then subsequently there was more degradation over time as some of the corals died off. So that by 2016, very few of the original colonies are alive. Um, however, the colony that's indicated by the arrow has persevered. And so that would be an example of like a coral that would be of, of interest because maybe it, it's more resilient to the types of stressors, which was a hurricane and, and heat stress um, that are happening in that area. So we're gonna be at the other sites using very similar techniques to, to what I've just described that we're doing at the, at the South Shore site. Um, however, we're going to also be adding in this element that I mentioned before. So after we identify that more heat tolerant stock, we will perform asexual propagation to boost the numbers. Um, and this will cause us to, to end up with somewhat smaller colonies, but a lot more colonies. And so we're trying to find a, a balance where we can get more coverage without sacrificing the size so much um, that the corals won't be able to be um, uh, successful. And, and eventually reproductive. Um, so putting out pieces that are too small doesn't actually work because um, if they're too small, they, they don't have a good success rate. So we have to, to, so we have to balance that. Um, but, but we can get more numbers by, by using propagation. Um, we're also gonna add some other ways to choose the more heat tolerant stock. So especially in Kaneohe Bay, we have prior knowledge of many colonies' um, performance during past leaching events. Um, we have colonies where, as I showed at the beginning of the presentation, you have side by side the same species with very different behaviors during, during the heat stress event. Um, and we have tags on some of those, many of those colonies. Um, so we could return to ones that appear not to suffer as much or to bleach during, during the heat stress event and sample them to get material to grow up um, propagules from. We also have access to spectral data where the reefs were scanned with an aerial spectrometer. And so some of the data from that indicate that particular wavelength color signatures um, are associated with corals or areas of corals that are less likely to, to bleach under heat stress. So we may try picking some of our stock based on, on that data, 
Um, and obviously something like that has big advantages um, if you want to scale this up or and actually use it um, around in, in other places um, because it's easier um, if you can get a lot of data from like a whole reef at once instead of having to go out and individually sample corals and then test them. Um, we're also really interested in genetic uh, markers for heat tolerance. So extracting DNA from samples and looking at um, you know their genes and as i've said before it's a complex trait so it's not going to be controlled by a, it isn't controlled by a single gene there won't be a smoking gun that tells you like this is a heat tolerant coral but there may be sets of genetic variants that are associated with heat tolerance and that would make screening corals easier so our workflow um, is to gather the coral source stock and apply one of those assessment methods to determine heat tolerance. And then based on the performance um, in the heat stress or in past leaching or because of the spectral data or because of a genetic um, signature, we'll propagate new colonies from that material and grow them up um, in shore-based and in field-based nurseries and get more material and then plant them out on the reef to become um, part of the restoration project. So this whole asexual method, it doesn't allow for new genetic variants directly. However, it still does have a lot of potential to support adaptation. So if we're able to restore reef areas with colonies that can persist there long enough that they can become reproductive, then those are gonna be able to cross naturally with other corals that are also persisting. And that will allow the population to adapt. Um, and this is why we think that carefully choosing which corals get propagated and put out and used in restoration projects seems very important. Um, and that's why we're doing um, these kind of projects to test that out. So that's the end of my talk about the, those approaches. Um, it's pretty exciting work to be involved in um, and it takes um, a lot of support to be able to do those kind of um, experiments and tests. Um, and here at the Gates Lab, we're funded by multiple different sources. Um, and also I'm putting up my email address because uh, obviously we can't talk right now or uh, answer questions, but if you have questions, um, please contact me. Alternatively, or in addition, um, there's also a website called restorewithresilience.org that has more information about the project here in Hawaii. Um, if you wanna learn more about um, the people that are involved, the, the way that it, that it works, um, and, and how things are going. Um, so with that, I'd like to say thank you for, for listening, um, and take care.